The Pentagon Arrow Office and the US Congress have starkly contrasting positions on UFO whistleblower testimonies. Remote viewing of the German mystic Maria Auschwitz shows that she was executed at the end of the World War II by Soviet troops. Phil Schneider's 1955 lecture revealed that aliens abducting humans are involved in adrenochrome trade. FOIA document reveals standardized military reporting mechanism for UAPs is linked to a radical majestic document on crashed UFOs. British Special Forces involved in UFO crash retrieval operations. There's compelling historical evidence presented that alien spacecraft have been successfully reverse engineered. The European Union Parliament holds a meeting on UFO reports. These stories are more on ExoPolitics Today, the week in review. You're listening to ExoPolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Welcome to the Week in Review for March 23rd. We are going to be covering quite a range of stories this week. There has been uh, quite a bit happening. So I want to begin with an article that appeared in The Hill, uh, which is a mainstream uh, news source. And it made a very good case for two very different positions on the UFO whistleblower reports that have been cited by many people and have kind of like led to the UFO issue becoming a, a, a hot button issue in the um, amongst the ma major media and of course uh, those that are following UFO reports. So the contrasting position in the Hill article is that the Pentagon and the ARA office are largely dismissive of UFO whistleblower reports saying that there have been crashed UFOs, that uh, these have been uh, taken to corporate facilities and are being secretly studied and attempts made at reverse engineering. Uh, so the Pentagon uh, report is very sceptical, emphasising that there's no evidence for any of that, whereas the US Congress and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence have the contrasting view that the whistleblowers who have come forward, people like David Grush, uh, people like um, the uh, Dr. Eric Davis, that they and others are very credible witnesses about the existence of these UFO crash retrieval programs and corporate uh, studies of these. So you have two very different approaches to the relevance of UFO whistleblower testimony. And so this Hill article, I think, does a good job in presenting the contrasting positions between what can be kind of like seen as almost black hats and white hats kind of doing this dance around the UFO issue. So very interesting and definitely worth following because we'll be coming back to this. I mean, this is all in response to that historical Arrow report on the, on the UFO issue uh, that came out a couple of weeks ago. Well, here is something that I thought was uh, very fascinating. This was a report on a remote viewing session done on the German mystic Maria Osic. Now, Dick Allgaier, uh, he was part, I believe there were five other remote viewers involved in this remote viewing pro project, and they remote viewed Maria Osic. Uh, of course, they didn't know it. It was a, a double-blind experiment, so, that, so neither they or the person who handed them the the coordinates, the target coordinates, knew what the what the target was, and it was Maria Osic. And uh, they got a lot of confirmation about Maria Osic being involved in 
uh, mysticism, being involved in channeling extraterrestrial entities, that Maria Orsic was involved in the uh, construction of uh, UFOs or flying saucers at the time. And, and Dick Ulgaier, his, his session was particularly noteworthy because he identified things about her that have long been rumoured, uh, but I think his remote viewing definitely uh, gives us a, a high degree of confidence that uh, what the rumours of Maria Osic have been over the 70 years or so uh, since the Second World War when she disappeared, that those are sub substantially correct. In, in other words, the that Maria Orsic was incredibly talented. She was a natural psychic in communication with higher beings. In fact, according to Orgaya, he detected that she was either a Nordic extraterrestrial herself or had Nordic genetics. And this is something that uh, others have been talking about. I mean, I have covered... Uh, one of these uh, contactees, one of the people who have been involved in a, a, a joint French-US secret space program, Jean-Charles Moyen, and another individual, David Rousseau, who saw Maria Orsic on a spacecraft and that she was a Nordic. And the information that has come from them and others is that Maria Orsic was part of a kind of Nordic infiltration program to try to help raise human consciousness. So Dick, Dick Orgaya, uh, he kind of like confirmed that. He said that she was extraordinarily beautiful, uh, highly gifted and natural psychic, very empathic, very committed to uh, humanity. And he said that what happened at the end of the Second World War was that she was uh, trapped in Berlin and that uh, she was cornered by a group of 10 uh, Soviet soldiers and uh, they brutally um, had their way with her and then executed her. So that was a very sad end. Now, people will ask, well, I mean, does that mean that all these stories about Maria Orsic being part of a joint French-US secret spouse program aren't real, uh, that that's nonsense because she was executed? Well, you know, this is a part of the way in which Nordics operate that, needs to be understood that when the Nordics uh, incarnate on Earth, they incarnate in an avatar body so that their original body, their, their Nordic body, is held on the spacecraft. Uh, and they go into kind of like in what we saw in the film Avatar, something similar to that, that they go into some kind of unit, some stasis chamber, and their consciousness transfers to an avatar that has been made on Earth. And so in her case, when the, the Soviet soldiers uh, executed her, her consciousness transferred back to the Avatar body on the Nordic ship. So that's how you can get uh, both stories being true, that Maria Orsic did incarnate in Germany prior to the Nazi takeover and then she had all, all, you know, this great struggle with uh, Nazi German authorities, Heinrich Himmler, the Nazi SS, in terms of uh, developing a peaceful secret space program, whereas the Nazis wanted to weaponize it. And, of course, at the end of the war, she's, she's killed, but she goes back up and she continues to teach up on, these, uh, on, on a joint Nordic uh, uh, U.S. ships. So, so yeah, so I think that is definitely worth listening to, uh, this remote viewing that Dick Ulgai uh, did on Maria Orsic. Answers a lot of questions about her. Uh, Jean-Charles Moyen, I was just talking about him. He has just released the English dubbed version of his movie South Shore Origin 2. So it's a fiction based on fact a film rendition of his um, uh, involvement, contacts with extraterrestrials, his recruitment into a, a U.S.-French secret space program, uh, battles with uh, Draco reptilians and uh, grey aliens. And, and what is really 
fascinating about this uh, film. It's a feature film, and so you can buy it on Vimeo. So there it is. I mean, um, you know, that you, you buy that video, you get a good deal. Buying that video becomes part of your uh, library, but also it supports Jean Charles. And the incredible thing is that Jean Charles did this movie, special effects and um, all the video editing uh, pretty much on his own. So it really was a labor of love. I know he's spent several years making this. So uh, so this is really a great way to support Jean Charles and a great way for you to red pill people who maybe don't believe uh, the information about secret space program, but are willing to be entertained uh, by a movie rendition. And so this is this is great for those that have uh, family, friends, workmates that are maybe skeptical uh, about these kinds of uh, secret space programs. But you can show them this, and just it's like a a fiction. It's a fictionalized version of what's really going on in the secret space programs. And uh, people can uh, say what what they think about that. So definitely worth uh, investing in that, and it does help support Jean Charles in uh, his work. Now here's a extract from a 1995 lecture that Phil Schneider did about the agenda of malevolent alien groups. So you know this. This video, uh, it's, an, it's an extract of, a, I think it was a, a two-hour lecture he gave in 1995. He, he did several lectures in 1995. Uh, he, he was very a very brave man. He came forward, uh, talked about his involvement as a civil engineer in the uh, construction of these uh, deep underground military bases, dumb bases. And that he was involved in the famous, uh, what was it, 1978 firefight at the Dulce Underground Base in New Mexico. And that he lost some of his fingers during that firefight. And he was a civil engineer. So he produced at his lectures a lot of evidence uh, supporting his claims. Now, unfortunately... Uh, he was just too too high profile. So he was suicided only months later. I mean, uh, he began doing his uh, whistleblower testimonies, uh, I, as I recall, sometimes in the middle of 1995. And in January, by January 1996, uh, he was found dead in his apartment. He had been suicided. Uh, you know, there had been a, uh, family members and people that looked at the uh, the coroner information said that there's no way he he uh, would have committed suicide and uh, this was something he himself warned about that he, he would be eliminated uh, with extreme prejudice because this is one of the things about the secret space programs or the people involved in these uh, unacknowledged special access programs. They sign non-disclosure agreements especially with corporations and because the, the corporations are uh, very security conscious and, and they do not want anyone that signed an NDA with them going rogue. I mean, with the military, uh, I, I think the military are a little uh, more lenient with people uh, who are soldiers who maybe disclose some of what they were involved in. Uh, but I think corporations are ruthless and they have uh, hired killers, Wackenhut and uh, some of these uh, private security firms that will go out there and really eliminate anyone that has broken an NDA. And they'll do it with extreme uh, prejudice to warn off others from doing the same thing. So uh, nevertheless, whether you're a military whistleblower or a corporate whistleblower, the consequences for violating a non-disclosure agreement can be quite severe, and Phil Schneider did. Now, one of the things he revealed that I think is particularly relevant is that in 1995, he talked about different alien groups that were involved in uh, the secret agreements 
uh, with the U.S. government, in particular the uh, federal variants of government, and he said that the aliens were extracting adrenochrome from people that were humans that were being abducted, um, and, and that that includes the one one hundred thousand small people <laughs> that go that were going missing each year. I don't know what it is now, but uh, definitely, uh, you know, there's a lot of people talking about uh, adrenochrome and you know these short people. If you, if you get the gist of that, that go missing every year, what what happens to them? And uh, I don't think it's necessarily just aliens. It's also the deep state figures. So, but he's revealing this in 1995. Uh, and I think that's very important. I think he uh, and Alex Collier were among the first to talk about aliens abducting people and especially you know, young, short people and doing things with them. And uh, so, of course, now it's you know, everyone's talking about adrenochrome and uh, you know what, how that's extracted, and but. Back then, back in the day, it was back in the 90s, very few people were talking about this. Phil Schneider, Alex Collier were among the two. Uh, I don't know when David Icke began talking about that. I think he also uh, was very prominent in the 90s. So a few a few pioneers uh, talking about this. Phil Schneider uh, on the end game, definitely worth watching that, that extract. I, mean, I think it goes for, what, nine minutes. So take a look at that. Okay, so here's something that I posted. The Aerospace Corporation is leading an initiative of 30 companies promoting a more diverse and inclusive space industry workforce. So, okay, so the Aerospace Corporation is is implementing or promoting a, a DEI initiative among 30 aerospace companies. So it's like, okay, well, that's, you know, that's interesting. Why, why do they want to have woke space companies? I, I guess that somehow is a, a priority for some companies like the Aerospace Corporation. But one of the things that got my attention was that this particular company is the same company that uh, the inventor, Dave Rossi, I've interviewed him uh, a couple of times now on Excel Politics Today, uh, actually I think three times altogether, and he is a contactee. He is working uh, with private industry on some um, highly classified programs. He's He has signed NDAs with those, so there's, there's a limit to how much he can reveal. But one of the things he did reveal was that the Aerospace Corporation was conducting extensive surveillance of none, other, none other than Elena Denam, the famous French archaeologist contactee who is also a emissary to the Galactic Federation of Worlds. And so they were behind a public smear campaign. So why in the world would a top aerospace company be doing this to a contactee? I mean, uh, isn't the standard operating procedure kind of dismiss and ridicule contactees? You know, why go after one in particular? Well, I mean, I, we know why they going after one in particular, that Elena Danan is credible. She is having direct face-to-face -face contacts with extraterrestrials and more importantly talking about things happening in space and one of the big initiatives she, that she's talking about is the hub that is being built on Jupiter or just above the atmosphere of Jupiter and that is a, a trading post that involves many major uh, earth corporations along with different extraterrestrials uh, who are going to be trading at that outpost there on the hub well, you know, this involves the signatories or people that participated in the Jupiter Accords of 2021. Now, the deep state were excluded. And the companies allied with the deep state, they are trying to build uh, an alternative to this. So Elena Danan told me that she is going to be talking about what she was told about this alternative to the hub that some of these major corporations are trying to develop. So now we get an idea of why you have the Aerospace Corporation wanting to discredit Elena Danan, because they don't want people to know that there actually is a kind of trading initiative happening with the hub above Jupiter, and that major aerospace companies, including, say, SpaceX 
and uh, you you have Blue Origin and uh, Virgin Galactic, you know, those kinds of companies that have signed on where the corporate leaders have said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll play ball and we'll abide by your rules. Whereas those deep state companies and the aerospace corporation, as far as I can tell, is a deep state company. Aerospace company, they, they want to, you know, they're not party to that. So very interesting. Let's see if you watch Elena Danan's The Week, uh, Star Nations News, she does it every Monday night. Uh, she's going to be talking about this. So definitely that's one that I'll be uh, watching closely and uh, pay attention because I think they're, we, we are getting a lot of exopolitics happening right now. Okay, so that's uh, Elena Danan where she uh, talked about the uh, aerospace, co sorry, um, yeah, that's just mentioning Elena Danan's Star Nations News and uh, Aerospace Com Corporation trying to discredit her. So here's uh, where I actually talk about the, the recent Star Nations News that Elena just did. Uh, that's last Monday. Uh, what would that have been? Uh, March 19, I think it was. So she talked about the moon having an organic consciousness similar to the organic consciousness called Pithalum that David Adair said was inhabiting or vivifying this, this um, fusion containment engine that he witnessed at Area 51 in 1971. And that this organic consciousness that he called Pithalum was part of a larger group of organic consciousness associated with a large extraterrestrial spacecraft and that it moved or transferred into his body and used his body as a lifeboat because it said that there would be a time in the future where my people would return and I would be able to join them. And in my interviews, I did a four-part series of interviews with David Adair. He said that this is happening now, that Pithalem's people, I mean, we're talking about uh, the organic consciousnesses that inhabit or drive or in, in control of these big motherships that are coming into our solar system, that, uh, that that is the group that Pithalum belongs to. And in the Star Nations News, she says that the, that the moon has an organic consciousness, that when you have these very large kind of planetoid ships, uh, you, you have a, you either have AI or you have an organic consciousness, and they're different. That the AI is something that we understand in terms of machine learning and a technology using algorithms and so forth, and eventually um, it operates um, using these algorithms and it is able to make decisions. And, and you know, that's what machine learning is all about. And so that's how you get machines uh, or AI being able to take control of things. But what we have with these starships is that you have an organic consciousness, uh, kind of similar to the to the consciousness of, say, like plasma consciousness, that you have big expanses of plasma out in the out in the galaxy, and that these have an organic consciousness, and that's similar to the consciousness that is used to drive these large motherships of the extraterrestrials. So those are very different to AI. And so Pithalum is like that. And, and of course, the moon has an organic consciousness that uh, powers it or is in control of the moon, and it has a crew. So there, there is this very important relationship between the organic consciousness behind uh, these very large sp space craft or planetoids and the crew that are chosen who have a, a special genetic connection and soul consciousness connection with the organic consciousness driving the craft. So, you know, that's why uh, you have the space arcs that are starting to awaken. The space arcs have an organic consciousness and also they have a crew and the crew are in pods. So this is uh, a very important kind of... Uh, under, uh, relationship to understand for how very large motherships or planetoids operate. And you know, this gives us an idea 
of uh, how important it is to the deep state, to the earth militaries, to not only find and to understand space arcs that are located throughout the planet, but to also find their crews, that the crews who are incarnated, uh, to find them because they're the ones that will ultimately be transferred in some way to the space arcs and that they will pilot those space arcs. And, and the deep state is all about control and the space arcs represent a wild card that they want to control. And so this is part of the part of the race. But, but I believe that the White Hats are on board with the different extraterrestrial entities showing themselves because they, they want us to move into a Star Trek future. And they know that revealing the extraterrestrial presence will propel us into this Star Trek future. Okay, now here we have something. There's uh, a reporting mechanism. So here you have it. So it's quite a, it is a FOIA document that shows that the US military or the different military services have a UAP reporting and material disposition protocol in place. Pardon me. And so what, what this tells us is that uh, the different military services, uh, they operate in a way where if a UFO is, is sighted, then they are going to uh, do the reporting of that UFO in, in a way that is standardised for all the military services so it can then be filtered through and ends up with a particular... Uh, organization and that's probably a good thing i mean that is a good thing given that uh, the national defense authorization act for 2024 included the creation of a uap records collection within the national archives and that the, the, there's an arch, arch, archivist that's responsible for that so it i, I don't know the particular connection between uh, the ua this uh, uap records collection and this creating a standard a standardized reporting mechanism for UAPs or UFOs, uh, but I imagine that there's probably a a link there between those things. But this was a part of this uh, standardized reporting mechanism that got my attention. So here's 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 what interested me. It said. Respective subordinates of the Department of Defense, uh, command and control, military departments and services, uh, coordinate with the All Domain Anomaly Research Office to determine the appropriate locations and entities to transfer all UIP objects and material of incidents, incursions and engagements in, undermined, in unmodified form in a manner consistent with the objects and materials classification and applicable applicable hazardous materials transport requirements. So, I mean, this is an unclassified document that was released through FOIA. So it's really talking about the transfer of all associated material concerning UAPs. Uh, now, that in a way is kind of like very suggestive in terms of, well, what else will be, will be transferred as part of this standardized reporting mechanism? So this is where we get into a classified version of this. And there was a classified version of uh, the transfer of all recovered UAP objects uh, that was leaked. Uh, and, and this was, it was called the Special Operations Manual. It was assembled or put together uh, sometime in 1954, and it was leaked as part of the uh, majestic documents that uh, began to be leaked in the 1980s and the 1990s. And I know that Dr. Robert Wood and his son Ryan did a lot to authenticate the Special Operations Manual where they got their hands on it, and they believe it is 100% genuine, that this that it represents a standardised reporting protocol for the uh, the uh, discovery, the san uh, for, for the for the sanitization and for the retrieval 
of crashed UFOs in the United States and anywhere around the world in between, involving all of the military services and the intelligence community. So I thought that that was very interesting, that here you have a unclassified version of a reporting and material disposition protocol uh, and that beneath that is a classified version. Now, I don't know if that classified version probably is an updated version of the 1954 Special Operations Manual, and so we can get an idea of what the classified version of this would be uh, by going to the majesticdocuments.com and taking a look uh, at their document collection. And there you'll find on that website the special operations manual that was released in 1954. And it, it represents a reporting and material disposition uh, standardized protocol that was adopted across the, the intelligence community or the military services at the time. So very, very interesting uh, how uh, the intelligence and the military services uh, set up a standardized process for dealing with UFOs, whether it's just reporting them or whether it's for uh, recovering and transporting that material to, to various locations. Okay, so here's uh, an article that Chris... Mellon did, uh, who is a former uh, Pentagon official. Uh, he worked uh, in the Pentagon for a number of years, and I think he was an assistant director for intelligence and security. And uh, he had some kind of um, good things to say about UFOs and crash retrieval operations. Now, this article uh, was something that came out uh, back in 2023, so it's quite a lengthy article, but it, it is well written. I mean, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't put myself in the category of uh, someone that uh, is overly critical of Chris Mellon. I, I think he is someone that is uh, within a certain set of parameters that he operates under trying to release information. Now, whether, whether this is something that helps move the issue forward or whether it's just part of a limited hangout, that's where I think uh, you know we're going to have um, you know, disagreements. I, I think he is part of a limited hangout, um, and and you know my reason is well as as I'm going to make clear now is that I, I think no one's going to disagree that government disclosure is a good idea due to uh, the need for greater government transparency and accountability. I mean, I think. Very few people will argue that, well, you shouldn't release UFOs because we don't want government transparency. We don't want government accountability because national security trumps everything. No, very few people are going to say that. Uh, so I, th I think most people would agree with him that that, that is a good thing. Uh, but, I mean, you, you're not really... I mean, everyone would agree with that. Uh, but the problem is that the way he frames his article is that he is trying to make it out as though um, that disclosure is something that's yet to happen and that what, what is necessary is that public officials release all they know to for this UFO disclosure process to move forward. Okay, so this is where I really part company with Chris Mullen because there's, there's two types of disclosure that, uh, uh, that we need to understand. Uh, there's official disclosure and there's public disclosure. Official disclosure is getting government, getting military to officially go on the record saying, yeah, you know, we have this UFO films or we have recovered UFO debris and this is what we found or this is what they are. So you, uh, and people are looking for that. Uh, and Chris Mullen is part of that group that is really focusing on official disclosure as the way forward, and this is this is the problem, um, because official disclosure is something that is dependent on government and militaries doing something that they have shown for the last eighty years that they they are not willing to do without a great fight, without great pressure, and that is to disclose the secrets uh, that they have accumulated concerning extraterrestrial life, flying saucers, UFOs, and so forth. 
But public disclosure, that is the process where private individuals or former officials come forward and talk about their experiences involved involving uh, UFOs um, and or those people who have had face-to-face contact with uh, extraterrestrials and they coming forward and revealing what they know. Now, when we contrast those that are part of this kind of official disclosure process or, or pushing for official disclosure, uh, you know, there's a paucity of data there. Uh, and, and that's and that's because uh, governments, militaries, are, are very parsimonious when it comes to revealing what they know about extraterrestrials and UFOs. But when it comes to people who have been witnesses, whether we're talking about insiders, contactees who have come forward, they tell us a lot about what they saw, what they experienced, and what's secretly going on. So I, I think really when we look at people like uh, Chris Mellon who are pushing this official disclosure narrative, you know, gov- we need transparency, gov- we need to have governments disclosing or militaries disclosing what they know and 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 therefore and thereby kind of like putting all the emphasis on trying to get official disclosure getting people uh to come forward who have solid whistleblower credentials that are willing to testify or you have um uh, scientists or scientific data being presented showing that this UFO phenomenon is real. In a, in a way, what's happening is that you do a disservice with those who have come forward, who have revealed aspects of what's going on, but for one reason or another, they don't have the, the same credentials. They they don't have, they're not able to show that they were part of certain programs uh, because records have been scrubbed. I mean, a good example is Bob Lazar. I mean, I think Bob Lazar is very real, very genuine. He was involved in this reverse engineering program concerning some craft that were released. Uh, There are others who have come forward who were also called into some of these programs and they participate to a certain extent, but the records have been scrubbed. So one, one example I give in my tweet here is uh, Stan Deo, and in the 1970s, he was talking about uh, some of these anti-gravity programs uh, that were in existence that involved the study of retrieved UFOs. So this, to me, is the problem that uh, Chris Mellon, like others um, involved in, say, some of these uh, programs like uh, the Galileo Project, and the uh, Scientific Coalition of UFO Studies are gatekeepers operating on a limited data set purportedly based on a strict scientific methodology that hides the big picture of what's happening in terms of extraterrestrials visiting us and secret space programs operating using reverse-engineered anti-gravity technologies. And, And if we really want to have... Uh, disclosure. We we shouldn't limit ourselves to some official disclosure process uh, where you only pay attention to whistleblowers, uh, people like um, David Grush, who can show or can prove that they have been part of these programs, but their testimonies and the programs they were involved in are very limited in terms of their disclosures. We, we need to be open, more receptive to whistleblowers, insiders, contactees who maybe don't have such impressive credentials, but they give us a much bigger picture of what's going on. So I, I think uh, this article by Chris Mellon uh, is helpful in moving the needle forward towards an official disclosure process, uh, but as but its big drawback is that it doesn't acknowledge people that have helped us understand the big picture that are part of a public disclosure process. Okay, so I did an interview uh, with uh, Danny Henderson where we discussed 
uh, the insider testimonies of JP. And, and JP is kind of a good example of what I was just saying. I mean, he is currently serving in the US uh, Army uh, and he is can only be known using this uh, uh, pseudonym or this, uh, yeah, the pseudonym for him, uh, which is JP. We use that pseudonym to hide his identity because if he were to reveal his identity, he would um, suffer repercussions in terms of his career. So he's actively serving in the army. He's been there now for five years and, and you know, he has family to support. So he doesn't want to risk that. So he's but he's being encouraged to reveal what he knows. Now, there are other insiders that, who have similar reasons for why they cannot reveal their identities. Uh, they can't all be like David Grush and reveal who they are because they've got families, they've got retirements, they've got um, salaries, uh, whatever it is that prohibits them or holds them back in revealing everything that they know. And, and so, so JP, I've revealed... Or he does regular updates. We do updates, and he reveals what he knows about different missions that he's been involved in. So I talked about some of these in this interview with Danny Henderson, uh, because some people maybe don't know the backstory. So this is a good interview uh, to listen to, so you can get the backstory on my relationship with JP, how and when I got involved with him, uh, what he knows. And, of course, I will be participating in a conference, uh, the Galactic Spiritual Informers Connection Conference. Uh, that will be held in uh, just outside of Denver, Colorado, in September of, of this year. So I'll be talking more about uh, JP and uh, JP plans to attend. So that is something we can talk more about uh, later in the run-up to that conference. So here's a story that I I thought was fascinating. This is a uh, a story concerning a veteran paratrooper uh, revealing that a British special forces were recovered had recovered a downed non-human craft in northern England in the late 1980s, and that supports whistleblower claims of a secret UFO crash retrieval program. So uh, the British paratrooper is uh, a veteran, Frank Mulburn, and he, I, I've learned about him uh, over the last couple of years. He's been writing some really well, well-written well articles uh, about the UFO, uh, UAP program as it has gone through the process of becoming uh, an official investigation in the U U.S. Congress, in the U.S. military, studying the uh, the development of the UAP task force and how that morphed into uh, the, the current arrow of office. And uh, he's been following that and he has presented really interesting data about these programs and what he has discovered. Uh, but what was interesting was that he revealed that he has a friend, an associate in the British Special Forces that confided in him about a secret UFO crash retrieval program and that this witness, this whistleblower, cannot reveal his identity for reasons that I've already described, that if he were to reveal his identity, uh, he could be targeted, uh, he fears for, for his uh, family and friends, what would happen, his pension and so forth. So these are all very relevant concerns, which, which shows that you know not all whistleblowers can be like a David Grush and just appear before Congress and say, here, you know, here I am, here's my credentials, and this is what happened. That you know, people that like David Grush were involved at a kind of like uh, let's just say they were involved at the less classified level of, of this phenomenon that they saw things, they experienced things, but when it comes to unacknowledged special access programs being directly involved themselves and, and having signed non-disclosure agreements, uh, people need to be very, very careful. 
So, uh, yeah, and to me this is interesting because one of the things I noticed being an Australian is that when I spoke to Australian whistleblowers, uh, a few have approached me. Uh, I mean, they were so scared. Uh, and, and I think that the reason that they were so scared about revealing the, you know, any details about themselves and their military services is because I, I believe that uh, these Five Eyes countries like Australia, uh, United Kingdom, and I'm sure Canada would be the same, that the when you sign these non-disclosure agreements, uh, there are very severe penalties if you violate those. I, I think in the US, because there are certain military services like the US Navy that are more supportive of whistleblowers coming forward, and of course, case in point, is JP. I mean, he's uh, getting encouraged by uh, a covert branch of the, of the military, in particular people associated with the Air Force, who are taking him from his uh, normal regular army service and putting him into these covert programs run by the Air Force, uh, covert programs which in which now would be Space Force, but not necessarily, uh, that they, they're putting him through these programs. And, and so... He gets permission, so he can come forward and he can talk about this. Uh, Stephen Greer, in the 1990s, he was able to get hundreds of military whistleblowers to come forward. And the reason he was able to do that, and some of these people identified themselves, not all, uh, but some of them, uh, others used acronyms and so forth, like JP, was uh, because the military services are much more forgiving. Uh, corporations, US corporations, are not forgiving. They will... You know, that, you know, look what happened to Phil Schneider. Uh, that's what will happen. But for uh, military whistleblowers, they can, they're given a certain degree of latitude because the mili US military stands to benefit greatly from disclosure. Because at the end of the day, when disclosure happens and all of these anti gravity technologies come out, all of these really cool uh, fusion containment en engines come out, who's going to benefit? Well, uh, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, they're going to benefit greatly because, you know, rather than having planes or having submarines that can just fly in the atmosphere or can kind of dive into the deep surface, you can have dual-purpose uh, planes and and uh, underwater objects that can go off into space. Uh, you can have secret space, but you can have uh, space carriers and all of those things, which... We know have been secretly built, but you can rather than having just maybe two or three of these, uh, you, you can have like you know, like the U.S. Navy currently has, I think, what is it, uh, eleven space, uh, eleven aircraft carrier battle groups. Uh, rather than having maybe two or three of those in space, you could have again a dozen. So yeah, the U.S. Navy and the Air Force would definitely benefit by all of this being. Uh, disclosed, which is why they give latitude to their secret, to their personnel to reveal some of what's going on. But when it comes to US corporations, no. When it comes to Five Eyes countries, their militaries in these Five Eyes countries, they say, no, you can't do it. And, and I, I, I can understand why a country like Australia, which is a kind of like a mid-level country uh, that wants to break into the big leagues, and you know they, they're doing that to a certain extent with the AUKUS agreement, where now all of a sudden the, the US and the United Kingdom are giving Australia all the secrets on uh, nuclear uh, propulsion systems for uh, their for their future generation of uh, submarines. That uh, this is where in Australia they have very tight discipline in terms of if you're part of the military and you've signed non-disclosure agreements, uh, you cannot break that. Otherwise, there will be severe consequences for you. So that doesn't happen in the United States. Uh, so I was very glad to hear that Phil Frank Milburn uh, was given uh, this information and felt that it was okay to reveal that. So that shows that uh, the, the British military are also on board to a certain extent with releasing some of this information. So that's that's good. I hope the same thing happens in Australia because I would love to talk to Australian whistleblowers and, and get their take on what's going on. Okay, so here's a interview I did with uh, Dan Willis, uh, who's a former 
uh, Navy veteran who uh, also participated in the 2001 Disclosure Project press conference or, uh, that was launched in Washington, D.C. He was uh, one of the speakers, one of the 21 witnesses uh, before the Disclosure Project. And uh, he did a presentation on Exopolitics Today on the historical data that uh, alien spacecraft have been secretly uh, retrieved and have been reverse engineered, uh, not just by the United States, but uh, earlier on by the Axis powers, in particular Germany, and that uh, he describes the historical data going back to Germany, Maria Osich, Nikola Tesla, W.O. Schumann, um, and others in the United States like Otis Carr, William Tompkins, who talked about uh, the uh, reverse engineering or the construction of anti-gravity spacecraft using Tesla principles and so forth. So it is a fascinating history. Uh, Dan Willis does a really good job in providing a chronological idea or flow of when things happened and what we know of the of those events in terms of uh, the secret study and reverse engineering of captured extraterrestrial spacecraft or the construction of anti-gravity vehicles using uh, principles that were handed down from Nikola Tesla um, and others like him. So uh, well worth watching that interview on Exile Politics Today with uh, Dan Willis. And the importance of the, uh, Dan Willis's interview is that it puts to rest this claim being made by those whistleblowers that are part of the official disclosure process. I mean, I mentioned earlier uh, Christopher Mellon, uh, Dr. Uh, Eric Davis, uh, Bob Lazar. They are all part of this narrative that is being pushed rather aggressively that, yes, uh, there are these retrieved spacecraft and that they have a non-human connection, and but the technology is too advanced. We have not been able to successfully reverse engineer that. And, and that is part of a kind of limited hangout which is being pushed by many people. Uh, George Knapp, uh, Jeremy Corbell are part of that. They are very clear in their opinion that there is no evidence of a captured extraterrestrial, or sorry, there is no evidence that any of these captured extraterrestrial spacecraft have been successfully reverse engineered. That is all speculation, conjecture, conspiracy theory that they do not agree with. And so that's where I part company with them because uh, they only want to acknowledge people like David Grush, people like Bob, Bob Lazar, people like Rick Davis as being credible whistleblowers or insiders, that people that I would consider to be credible, people like Phil Schneider, people like uh, JP, people like Alex Collier, uh, people who have been saying that they, they've been part of these reverse engineering programs or that they know of crash retrievals, like uh, Clifford Stone, for example, that they would not agree that these are credible people. They would say that that's speculation. And so, you know, we've got a part company on that because I, I think if we want to get the big picture, we need to look at those that have come forward, that have shared something about what they know, but because they were involved in, you know, the highest level of classification when it comes to these UFO issues, uh, they have. Uh, had their records scrubbed or they fear for their safety or, or they can only have been able to reveal only so much. Okay, so uh, here's another article in The Hill uh, that this that describes uh, these uh, significant uh, distortions in the historical review of UFOs that came out a couple of weeks ago. And, and what I found very interesting about this article, and I think it was well written. I mean, the author is uh, Mark von Rettenkampf. Uh, he pointed out 
that the types of uh, omissions and distortions in this historical review was uncannily similar to the same process that was used to discredit Project Blue Book and to discredit reports, official reports such as Project Sign describing uh, UFOs as possibly being extraterrestrial in origin, that there were there, that there was a similar historical official process to discredit those investigations, those reports by people that that really were sincere in wanting the tr truth to come out, that were part of the military, that were part of the scientific establishment, that wanted the truth to come out, and that uh, there was a, a, pro a process um, in involved that tried to uh, discredit them. So to, to my mind, this, this is very important, that there is uh, what that... Uh, article described as the anti-source of faction in the Pentagon. Now, that anti-source of faction uh, that existed, say, eight, eight decades ago, um, uh, Project Blue Book uh, began in 1953. So we're talking, oh, sorry, that's seven decades ago. Uh, so seven decades ago, you, you had uh, this uh, anti-source of faction existing, kind of like a uh, cracking down on Project Blue Book and, and, and in, the, in the same way. Because Project Blue Book, it did look at some historic uh, UFO studies. Uh, in particular, there was this uh, initial Air Force study by Project Sign. It was a preliminary, the preliminary uh, assessment of the UFO data. And it concluded that the extraterrestrial hypothesis is a viable explanation. That's all it did. It just said it was a viable explanation. So while that was too much for this anti-source of, source of faction that was being headed at the time by uh, a four-star, uh, well, the, the um, chief of staff of the Air Force, General Hoyt uh, Vandenberg, who said remove the extraterrestrial hypothesis from this uh, assessment, uh, from the project sign team. So they, they had to remove it, and then they come down with a sanitized version of that report. And so Project Blue Book reported on that. And so this article says that, well, what we, what we see in this historical UFO review or UAP review that the Arrow Office just released has within it the same pattern, the same pattern of emissions and, and distortions that sabotaged Project Blue Book. So it's quite clear that uh, there is an attempt to really sabotage any genuine disclosures, any official disclosures uh, concerning UFO. So as I've kind of like uh, mentioned several times now, you know, you, you have one branch or one group that wants to shut down UFO disclosure. Uh, typically, they're associated with the aerospace community, um, and then and and then you have and and I mentioned earlier the aerospace corporation. These are corporations working with the deep state, and they benefit from these secret contracts involving reverse engineering of captured extraterrestrial vehicles because they have a, a, a monopoly on the on the artifacts or on the retrieved objects. There's something that is called an in internal research and development agreement whereby uh, the military or, or governments or the intelligence community throw a bunch of money at a corporation and say, you study this. And once they sign, once that organization signs with that corporation, say, for example, the Aerospace Corporation, he's handed some, say, crashed UFO material and, say, the Air Force or Space Force hands over that material to the Aerospace Corporation and they sign an IRAD, this uh, agreement, then that material belongs to that corporation. So this has been going on for decades now. And I think corporations that have accumulated a lot of material, a lot of empirical evidence, they're threatened by the new boys in town. Or new corporations like SpaceX, like Blue Origin, like Virgin Galactic that have signed on or participated in these agreements that are part of the Jupiter Accords. So this is why I, I think that you have this any sort of source of faction wanting to shut this down because there are major aerospace corporations, legacy aerospace corporations that stand to lose 
um, if this information is released into the public sector. Okay, so here's uh, something that I thought was very, very interesting, and that is that there was an announcement that on March 20, uh, that there was a meeting in the European Parliament in Brussels on the UAP reporting and scientific assessment. Now, I, I don't know anything about the meeting, um, w whether it was uh, parliamentarians uh, holding a, a, a kind of a, a committee session, hearing witnesses, or whether it was just a meeting that was that was sponsored and took place in the parliament. I don't have those kind of details. But you, you can see some of the participants um, at that meeting. You know, we're probably talking about scientists, astronomers, uh, biologists, or your UAP experts reporting on the UAP issue being something that merits rigorous scientific scrutiny. So, you know, that's the door that is used to prize open uh, parliaments or congresses to take the issue seriously. And I understand why, uh, you you know, you, you want to pitch it at that level to kind of open the door. That's that's fine. But I, I think... I, I think this is a good thing in terms of opening the door and, and getting these uh, uh, parliaments, you, you were talking about the European Union Parliament, to open the door to get this UFO issue being taken seriously. Uh, but I think you probably will find that a similar process happens in the European Union Parliament as has happened in the US Congress, which is that uh, you're going to have a number of of parliamentarians uh, that are supportive, want the information to come out. They're all about transparency and accountability, uh, but they're going to get stonewalled. They're going to get uh, a, a lot of pushback by corporations or officials that have been bought out that are uh, part of the secrecy system. And 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 so I, I think at the end of the day, what we've seen happening in the US Congress is going to happen in the European Union. That, sure, you're going to have... Uh, some members of Congress, some members of the European Union, uh, parliamentarians, congressmen being very supportive, wanting to push this issue forward, that they are serious in disclosure, but there's going to be pushback. They're going to be stonewalled and nothing's going to happen or very little is going to happen. Uh, it will be a kind of drip, drip disclosure. So that's why I, I think there's, there's going to be a, a catastrophic disclosure. That's going to happen. I, I don't see any other alternative. I mean, I really don't see any official process. And I don't see uh, these people that are pushing uh, the US Congress or pushing the European Congress to come forward. You know, people that are pushing David Grash, people that are pushing Eric Davis, uh, people that are trying to push Bob Lazar. I, I, I don't think that that is going to bring about the kind of disclosure we want. There's going to be catastrophic disclosure. I think it's going to be the extraterrestrial mothership showing up. I think it's going to be the uh, arcs, the space arcs showing up. I think it's going to be the inner Earth beings showing up, showing their stuff because they're monitoring our planetary consciousness and they understand that there's only a very small minority of people. Or let's put it this way: that you know, of the entire planet, there's maybe only one percent of people that give a damn about UFOs. And of that one percent of people, a tiny fraction of those are people associated with the deep state or want the deep state to keep it secret. All the rest, the people that are informed about this, that give a damn about this, and, you know, you're talking 1% of, of 8 billion people. Let's just say 1% of 8 billion people give a damn about UFOs, right? Let's just say 1%. Well, 1% of 8 billion people is what, 80 million? 80 million people give a damn about UFOs. So of that 80 million, how many of those are part of the deep state and, and want to keep everything secret? Okay, maybe maybe let's just say uh, a million of those are truly deep state and want to keep it secret. Okay, a million of those. So that's so that's say 80, 79 million out of that 80 million want disclosure to happen. They they want the truth to come out. So the extraterrestrials, the inner earth beings, the space arcs, the, the orbs that are monitoring humanity's consciousness, they're saying, hey, look, look at this. You know, we, we have an, a ratio of maybe 80 to 1 of humans wanting disclosure to happen. So we look at that and we say, we don't need permission from uh, the deep state. We don't need permission 
uh, from the US Congress to show ourselves because we see the collective consciousness wants disclosure to happen. So we're going to do it. We're moving forward. And so the deep state knows this. So they're, you know, they're trying to sabotage or slow the, slow the process forward, but it's not happening. And so I think that's why we're going to have a catastrophic disclosure. And it could happen as soon as this year. I'm betting it will. Okay, so I, I will be talking about this in my Crypto Terrestrials, Ancient Guardians of Earth Secrets webinar that is happening today. So a few hours, uh, this week in review goes out on East Coast time, 6 a.m. And so eight hours after this webinar, after this week in review goes out, my webinar uh, will start. And you can sign up. There's still plenty of time to sign up. It will be today. Uh, why crypto terrestrials matter? And so I will be walking you through the history of crypto terrestrials. That is, uh, and here I'm going to be focusing on non human beings that live in the inner earth or at the bottom of the oceans and that they predate humanity. That humanity, as we understand it, or on the surface, that we are a byproduct of 22 extraterrestrial civilizations seeding us here, and that we're just the latest phase of this planet Earth being used as a kind of petri dish, if you like, as a biological experiment for extraterrestrials to come up with a hybrid that can not only resolve problems between the different crypto terrestrials on Earth that go back hundreds of millions of years that you go back hundreds of millions of years even before humanity was created that there were indigenous races of insectoids of um, uh, aquatic races reptilian races and so forth on the planet and they went through different processes so i'm going to explain all that and that history but also say explain why it's relevant today and that's where we get into this whole catastrophic disclosure catastrophic disclosure i think is coming and it's going to be because uh humanity by and large the those people that proportion of humanity that cares about ufos that cares about extraterrestrials that, that they're, they're not asleep so people who are awake or interested in this they want disclosure and so Everyone, the inner earth beings, the extraterrestrials, the aquatic beings, they are all looking and monitoring Earth's consciousness. And they see that, okay, humanity wants the truth to come out. They're ready for us. So I think the crypto terrestrials, they're going to come forward. And they, and they are a big part of what's going on. And I think there's a very interesting dynamic between surface humanity, the crypto terrestrials that represent these in a way failed biological experiments on on the surface of the planet and the extraterrestrials that are sponsoring this current biological experiment on the surface of the planet because they want it to succeed because it's gonna give them a recipe for or give them a means of maybe solving some big galactic problem so a fascinating uh process there so i will be talking about that at my webinar so that will be taking place later today. So you can just uh, go and register, go to exopolitics.org and you will be able to uh, register for that, uh, for that webinar. So that is it for the week in review for March 23. Uh, thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, click and subscribe uh, wherever you're watching this uh, video. And thank you for watching and I hope to see some of you today at the webinar. And for those that don't, uh, that don't join in, I'll see you next week with the Week in Review. You have been listening to ExoPolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books webinars and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.